Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Duncan Brown and I'm a trustee with the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. I hope this webinar finds all of those tuned in safe and well. This December webinar is when we finish our 40th year. For those who don't know it, the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs was started in 1980 and it is my honor to pay tribute to its founder and current president, Frank Bird. Frank, who has been the face of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs when we conduct the seminars live, is by the way, doing just fine for those who are worried about him. He is working behind the scenes as we have gone from live in-person talks into this webinar mode. And now switching gears a little bit, December is also the month in which we celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa to name a few. And why do I bring this up? And because years ago, the BCFA received an endowment from former Secretary of State Alexander Haig's estate to support a seminar during the Christmas season. Uh, Haig, for those who don't know, was the Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan from 1981 to 82. And his endowment was provided by his brother, Father Frank Haig, a longtime Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs member and a former president of multiple colleges and a former physics professor at Loyola University in Baltimore. Now the three religions, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, emphasize various beliefs. Uh, today lights adorn Christmas trees, homes, various displays uh, in deference to the birth of Christ. Hanukkah on the other hand, celebrates the festival of lights and commemorates a miracle. And Kwanzaa provides for a cultural message emphasizing the values of family and humanity. So whether it's Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, each belief system highlights light and illumination which hopefully foretells of promise and hope. And as we move through December and to the end of 2020, and it's been a tough year for many, we all know that, let us be thankful for the fact that we do have hope. We do have a COVID vaccine on the way. We hope that some of the divide in America will be healed. We hope that many who are unemployed will find employment. And we hope that 2021 will be a little less rancorous, a little less filled with sickness and death and more filled with hope and prosperity. And now to tonight's webinar. Before I introduce Paul Goebel, a, couple of, a quick announcement regarding the logistics for tonight's webinar. We are using the Zoom webinar platform tonight, so everyone is automatically muted and will stay muted. Additionally, the only persons you should see on your screen will be myself or Professor Goebel. Tonight's web webinar will include remarks by Professor Goebel followed by the Q&A session. Audience questions will be handled through the Q&A function in Zoom. The Q&A button should be located at the bottom of your screen. If you just click on the button, type in your question, select goes to everyone and hit submit, that will do it. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs YouTube website in a couple of weeks. And now to tonight's speaker. Professor Paul Goebel is a longtime specialist on ethnic and religion issues in Eurasia. Most recently, he was the Director of Research and Publications at the Azerbaijan Diplomatic Academy. Earlier, he served as the Vice Dean of Social Sciences and Humanities at Odense University in Tallinn, Estonia, and as a Senior Research Associate at the Euro College of the University of Tartu in Estonia. While there, he launched the Windows on Eurasia U series, which continues to this day. Prior to joining Euro College in 2004, Professor Goebel served in various capacities in the US State Department, including as an advisor on Soviet nationality issues and Baltic affairs to Secretary of State James Baker. He also served in the CIA, the International Broadcasting Bureau, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, including as its communications director and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Professor Goebel writes frequently on ethnic and religious issues, and he has edited eight volumes on ethnicity and religion in the former Soviet space. He is also the author of more than 100 articles and chapters and more than 1,000 op-eds in US and European publications. He was trained at Miami University in Ohio and at the University of Chicago. He has been decorated by the governments, not just one government, but by all three governments, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, with their very highest civilian awards for his work in promoting Baltic independence and the withdrawal of Russian forces from those formerly occupied lands. Please join me in giving a warm, albeit virtual welcome to Professor Paul Goebel. And now, sir, over to you. Thank you, Duncan. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity uh, to speak to uh, Council on World Affairs group again. 
I've spoken to many across the country, but it's been some time and this is a great pleasure. At, in the past year, most Americans have focused on the coronavirus pandemic and on our own election. When we have talked about foreign affairs, we've almost always focused exclusively on the issue, what are we going to do about China? How are we going to cope with China's rising power at a time when it seems set to eclipse ourselves and others? The question is usually uh, reduced down to the issue, how are we going to manage this? How are we going to manage a rising power? And when we have discussions about that, we focus on two things. First, what do we actually want from China? What do we want China to do? What do we want China not to do? And second, how do we assemble the constituencies and the support groups within our own country to make it possible for us to support whatever policy we choose to, depending on how we relate to China as a rising power, some groups in the United States are going to be winners, others are going to be losers. If we do not think in great detail about how we're going to make that work, uh, no policy that we choose to adopt will last long enough to make the differences that we may want. Talking about how we cope with a rising power is not something new. 75 years ago, we were talking, we were asking the same question about how to cope with the rising power of the Soviet Union. This was before it became a nuclear power, but it had the largest army in the world. It was occupying half of Europe and it was behaving in ways that didn't make sense to us, that we couldn't make, couldn't figure out. Fortunately, at that time, George Kennan, uh, the American uh, expert on Russia, who was the political counselor at that in, in 1945, and then went on to be ambassador uh, to the Soviet Union a bit later, wrote what became known as the Long Telegram, which was then republished as Sources of Soviet Conduct, which was an effort to understand, to explain to Americans what kinds of things were driving the Soviet leadership. Why were they behaving the way they were? Why did they act in the way that they did? And what did, could we do about it? Kennan pointed to the fact that, even though the word was not used, that the Soviet Union had all three qualities or aspects of what we later sp have spoken of being characteristic of a superpower. It had an enormous military. <clears throat> it had a powerful economy. And it had an ideological message which, re, which was able to reach out and generate support for itself in other countries. It was because it had all three of those things, an ex, he said, an existential threat to the United States. And that we had to figure out how we could respond without war so that that existential threat would eventually go away. When Kennan talked about that, he talked also about the need to focus on how we would put together a constituency in the United States that would support a long-term disciplined campaign which for containment, the idea of containing the Soviet Union until its internal con contradictions would cause this, that system and that country to collapse. What he suggested, not in this article, but in other, in other articles and speeches at the time, was that the United States needed to form an alliance within the United States between those concerned with democracy and human rights, which after all was what we were interested in, in doing away uh, with the communist threat, and also the American business community, which would, of course, be interested in the Russian market, would be interested in gaining access to Russian natural resources, but needed somehow to be disciplined to prevent that from happening and undercut the possibility of a long-term containment. In order to do that, it was necessary to come up with some strategies that kept those two groups together 
and that made sure that neither one went off the reservation to the point that it undermined the possibility of Washington having an effective policy. Fortunately, for a remarkably long period of time, the United States was able to maintain that alliance. That was, it was largely driven by the fact that people in the human rights community, people concerned about democracy, were encouraged, were told to understand that Russia, which had never been a democracy, that Russia had no democratic or free market tradition. There was a brief period at the end of the 19th and early 20th century when it looked like it might develop in that direction, but it didn't last very long. How are they going to go from sort of zero up to what we hoped for? That was going to take time, and the human rights democracy community was encouraged to think in those terms. The business community, at the same time, was encouraged not to think about breaking ranks and for making money off of the Soviet Union, which it certainly could have done, and some American business interests had done earlier, Armand Hammer being the most famous. Uh, and what was kept, what kept the business community in line, as it were, were the, the fears businessmen in America had of being called soft on communism. Now, this maintaining this balance was never easy. Both groups were inclined to go in their own direction far too far. Um, the human rights people wanted that to be the only issue we talked about with the Russians. Um, that was never going to be possible given Russian power, especially after they acquired nuclear and hydrogen weapons. Uh, and the business community desperately wanted to be involved in the Russian economy, which was growing and which pre presented the possibility for enormous new earnings for American business. <coughs> this came to a head many times, but perhaps the most infamous was in 1972 when President Nixon made his first trip to the Soviet Union as president and took along with him an Ameri a group of American business executives. While there, there was a discussion of the construction of a pipeline out of the Soviet Union into Eastern Europe. And the American business executives who were there were very interested in providing equipment to help the Soviets achieve that pipeline. The human rights types dissented mightily and pointed out that if the American business community sold, um, sold this kind of equipment to the Russians, they might make profit, but they would be violating fundamental American values because the people who would be operating uh, the American equipment would be under American, under American law slaves, to which the president of one American corporation responded, but isn't it better that Soviet slaves should use American equipment than use their own, which won't be nearly as good? The sale never happened, but that kind of pressure existed and that kind of tension was something in the United States uh, that we had to live with and we had to manage both to keep the pressure up on the Soviet Union and also uh, to avoid things sliding into a confrontation and war which neither side was going to be able to win in a nuclear age. Now, over time, the Soviet economy was under, strength, under increasing pressure because of containment policy and restrictions. The system was an aging leadership that was increasingly weak, and it began to die. It began to fall apart. That was highlighted by Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika and glasnost program. And during his first visit to Washington, uh, he brought along with him Georgi Arbatov, who was the head of the USA and Canada Institute in Moscow, and a famous, the, probably the most prominent Americanist in the a Soviet hierarchy. Arbatov gave a press conference uh, in which he said something which I think we should never forget. He said that Mik Mikhail Gorbachev was going to do something far more horrible to the United States, far more threatening than any of his Soviet predecessors. He was going to take away America's enemy. And without an enemy, Arbatov said, the United States was going to find it very, very difficult to function. 
it's probably the case that Arbatov did not know just how far Gorbachev was going to go in taking away an enemy, destroying not only the communist system, but the USSR as a territorial entity. But he certainly was onto something important because with the demise of the Soviet Union, the United States turned away from paying attention to Russia and indeed paying attention to much of the world for a decade. We accepted the idea propounded by Francis Fukuyama that we were at the end of history, that the demise of the communist system in Europe uh, meant that democracy and free markets were inevitable. They would always be on the, uh, on the rise, that the United States was the champion of these things, but it really didn't need ver to do very much to make sure that they happened. The Americans were quite prepared to accept this as, as a, a blessing of what they had done and to declare that this, the Russian Federation, the successor state <coughs> of about half of the USSR, was already a democracy. And the only real issue <coughs> was to make sure that the economy got managed properly. We didn't pay attention to what was going on in Russia in the 1990s, and because we didn't, we were totally unprepared for the recovery of Russia as it, as it uh, has taken place under uh, Vladimir Putin, and the threat that that government poses not only to our friends in Europe and elsewhere, but to ourselves. Indeed, in many ways, the end of the Cold War, the demise of the Soviet Union, and what happened in the 1990s created a situation in Russia which poses particular challenges to the United States, which we are incredibly ill-equipped to deal with. And I want to talk about those tonight. We didn't pay attention to what was going on and we ignored a fundamental reality. The destruction, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the communist system in 1991 in the USSR was a shock that few countries and few peoples have ever gone through. It led to chaos, it led to disorder, it led to a situation in which gov the government in Moscow no longer had effective control over a whole bunch of things. Uh, some people had doubts about how much control it had over the military, but it certainly lost control over the economy and a situation arose in which, through a variety of criminal means, a mafia-like organization privatized into its own hands <coughs> most of the economic wealth that had been developed by uh, the Soviet Union. Russia was not growing, it was contracting. The Russian state was falling apart. But what was happening was that a group of, of Russians using the power of the police and criminal activity more generally, uh, were able to put this money into their own hands. And because there was nothing to invest it in in Russia, because Russia, the Russian economy was collapsing, they began moving this money abroad. Between 1991 and 2000, something over a trillion, a trillion US dollars left Russia and went into major banks, businesses, uh, and individual pockets, it has to be said, in the West. That changed the world. There was no longer a sense that cooperating with Russia meant you were soft on communism. There was no communism to be soft on. And there was a situation in which the, uh, the role of enormous funds gained illicitly, and then exported, became the major force in Russian foreign policy. And we'll come back to that. Tonight, I'd like to go through a little bit, in a little bit more detail, uh, what this process involves. And to do so, I would like to propose a very, uh, in a very modest way, <laughs> some ideas about what the sources of post-Soviet Russian conduct are. Because I think you have to understand three fundamental realities 
that most people don't want to admit because admitting these problems forces us to understand that we have an enormous obligation because we face challenges we don't know quite how to handle. First, with respect to the Russian Federation, with respect to the government in Moscow, we are dealing with a declining power. We're very good about talking about how we can cope, how we can manage a rising power. We're much less good about talking about how we deal with a power that's declining because a declining power is invariably more dangerous than a rising power because like a dying star, it can flare up into a supernova and destroy everything around it. Indeed, there are forces in the course of a, of a declining um, country that guarantee that that kind of outcome will happen. Second, since 2000, and especially since 2000, 2008, both the Munich speech by Mr. Putin and the Russian invasion of the Republic of Georgia, we are dealing with a revanchist power. Many, many Russians are very unhappy that 1991 happened. They would like to have it reversed. They want to reverse not only what happened in 91, but much else besides. And because they believe that that is the only way that they can succeed and be important in the world, Mr. Putin has gained enormous support domestically for an agenda which is fundamentally aggressive and subversive. And that aggression and subversion takes various forms. It is many of them new to us, but are nonetheless as serious as anything the Soviets did. And indeed, in many cases, more serious, not only because we don't, know, we don't recognize them, but because we don't have the defense mechanisms in place that will prevent them from succeeding. And third, and this is perhaps the most important thing to know at, at general term, with Mr. Putin, we're dealing with a hybrid approach. If there is one word that should be associated with Vladimir Vladimirovich, it is hybrid. That usually is taken to mean the combination of things, but it is not just a com combined approach, but it, is in, it involves using the strengths of an opponent against the opponent. Mr. Putin is, as many of you know, a martial arts master, black belt. He grew up in that world and his skill is in it has, as a politician, as a political leader, has been using the strengths of his opponents against them. That, see, that may seem odd to a country that is used to being sufficiently strong that we don't have to worry about that. But Mr. Putin has understood that when a country is very strong, but is incautious in thinking about the, its vulnerabilities, that others can make use of those vulnerabilities to achieve what they want. And certainly uh, that, has, uh, that has driven what we have seen in his dealings with everyone in the world and with ourselves. What we are seeing is a situation where each of these is playing a huge, huge role in what is going on in Moscow and how it is relating to us. And it is something I think we need to appreciate. And the rest of my time, I would like to devote to examining each of them in a little more detail. And then end by posing three questions, which I hope all of us can ask about what do we do about this? Um, I've testified a number of times before Congress and I'm usually given to predicting disaster because that's the way I think about things. And at the end of my testimony, I'm always asked, well, Mr. Gobble, you've told us how things, how bad things are. Now, how do we solve it? That is a peculiarly American approach. Uh, it's a good thing about us as a culture, but it is something that uh, says something about how we approach the world. However, because I'm now speaking to Americans, I can't avoid speaking to that by asking at the end three questions that I hope will lead us to think exactly what should we be doing. First then, 
Russia is a declining power. It has lost completely two of the three things that make a superpower. It has an economy which has dropped from the top five or six down to, depending on whom you believe, barely making it into the G20. It, it uh, does not produce anything that the world wants. It exports raw materials and the less processed they are, the more people want them, the more processed they are, the fewer people want them. It is, it has a society, it has a political system where the, which has delivered economic collapse. Russians today are earning, are, have incomes, real incomes, less than they had a decade ago and a decade ago, they had them less than a decade before that. This is a situation where life expectancies are declining, not increasing, <coughs> where the a uh, number of Russians already cut in half by the death of the Soviet Union country went from closely on par with the United States to now having just over 140 million people. And it is declining at the rate of more than a million people a year. That's because of excess deaths and declining births. People are choosing not to have children because they don't see a future that's very bright for them and they are dying sooner. That's a result not only of historical problems like alcoholism and poor diet, but also Mr. Putin's desire, efforts to raid social spending and divert it to military, military goods. Uh, he has, since 2001, closed half of the hospital beds uh, that existed in the Russian Federation. As a result, many people can't get treated and we're seeing now with the coronavirus uh, that just how disastrous that is. The Russians, the Russian government admits to 43,000 dead. Most experts in Russia, epidemiologists, say the real number is well over 100,000. And I have seen numbers as high as 250,000 dead in the last year. Excess deaths caused by the coronavirus. Uh, the Russian government won't admit to that, but we're talking about a country that's in real trouble. We've got, um, it is, it has lost its control over most of the neighborhood. Uh, it has, it, it, it doesn't, its military strength is, it's, it, excuse me, uh, this ideological image that it had of itself as the wave of the future no longer attracts people. In addition the economic, to the economic things, we have a situation where the country really lacks the ability to hold itself together. Um, most Americans mirror image whenever they talk about another country. We have, we go to the moon, they go to the moon. We have satellites, they go, have satellites. We have nuclear weapons, they have nuclear weapons. We have interstate highways, they must have interstate highways. There are fewer miles of paved road in the Russian Federation than there are in my home state of Virginia. The largest country on earth doesn't build highways and last year it built less than, less than a thousand kilometers of them, new ones. Almost all of those were right around the city of Moscow. The rest of the country is disconnected. You literally can't get there from here. This is a situation that is only going to get worse. Ideologically, it's not attractive to people. It, isn't, it simply isn't getting people to think that Russia is where they want to go. And Russia's own ideology, which is based on the uniqueness of Russia, on Russian nationalism, on a unity with the Russian Orthodox Church, is offending people. Right now, there is only one country of the former 15 republics that's anywhere close to being loyal uh, to Russia, and that's Turkmenistan, the most repressive place of all in the former Soviet space. <coughs> so this is this is in trouble. There's the the problems of the society are so enormous; it is difficult 
for me to, to, to even focus on them without being furious. The Russian government got enormous credit in the United States for being the first to produce a coronavirus vaccine. What people did not realize is the Russian government had so destroyed the pharmaceutical industry in that country, again, thanks to Putin policies, that it is not able to produce enough of that vaccine domestically to solve or to, uh, to inoculate the 60% of the population it needs. It's been going around desperately trying to find foreign countries who will produce the vaccine and then ship it back to Russia. That is not a superpower. That is a country that is in desperate shape. And what we are going to see is more of those problems in the future. I could go on for hours about the fact that the Russian government really doesn't care about its own population. It is cared about extracting money from it and then sending that money abroad rather than spending it on the Russian people. At present, it is estimated that there are close to 2.5 billion, or excuse me, 2.5 trillion US dollars of Russian money floating about in the West, in the big banks, in London, Berlin, Paris, and New York. <coughs> Again, if you have a country that is functioning, you invest in yourself. If you don't, you put the money elsewhere. Uh, that, if that were the end of it, that would be fine, but we'll come back and see that's not the end of it at all. The one thing that gives Russia claims, a claim to being still taken seriously as a superpower is that it has the second largest arsenal, arsenal of nuclear weapons. Yes, that's true. And a single nuclear weapon can, as they say, ruin your whole day. It is, Russia deserves to be taken seriously because it has nuclear weapons. But, and this is the important thing, its military is a shambles. Most recently, the Armenians lost in, to the Azerbaijanis in Karabakh, a war which some of you may have read about or seen on reports on television uh, several weeks ago precisely because the Armenians were using Russian weapons and the Azerbaijanis were using Israeli and Turkish weapons. The Russians got handed a black eye. Their own weapons were not capable of standing up to the weapons that the Azerbaijanis were bringing in from Israel and Turkey. As a result, it's Russia is losing arms sales uh, abroad and I think that's a big, uh, uh, that's going to be a big problem in the future. Second, its Navy, including aircraft carriers, which it has one, and icebreakers, which it has more of, have become something of a joke. The Russian government has one aircraft carrier, which smokes so badly that it looks like it's burning when it's floating by. The Russian government decided to address that only to discover that the money they were sending to put them to, to correct the problem in the Kuznetsov, the aircraft carrier, was going into London banks of oligarchs rather than into fixing that ship up. And the, air, the icebreakers, which have gotten a great deal of attention in recent months because of the warming in the Arctic and the possible northern sea route, are not coming online as fast as they were supposed to. The next one is due in 2027, not this year or next. And the one that did put to sea earlier this year, only two of the three engines worked and it couldn't break the thick ice that it was supposed to. <coughs> that doesn't mean that Russian icebreakers aren't going to be effective at some point, but it does mean that the military ability to project power this way is more limited. The Russian military is a shadow of its former self. Uh, it had 5 million men at the end of Soviet times. It now has under a million. It has more generals, though, uh, top-heavy, uh, unfortunately for them. 
And there are real problems about what that military is for, because so much of its function seems to be devoted uh, to uh, domestic control. If it did not have nuclear weapons, if Russia were a nuclear free state, Russia would be largely ignored. It has an economy that doesn't matter. It has an, a national ideology which doesn't attract people, but rather pushes them away. But it does have nukes. Nukes give you a seat at the table and they guarantee that you won't be attacked. We've sent that message to the point that any number of unfortunate countries are desperately trying to get nuclear weapons and we'll get them, I believe, um, because once you have one, attacking you, attacking you is not such a good idea. It explains what the North Koreans are doing, and it explains what I believe the Iranians will be able to do uh, within finite time. Everyone pays attention to North Korea because it has nuclear weapons. If it did not have nuclear weapons, no one would be pay paying attention. If Russia were willing to live within its own borders, if Russia were willing to try to develop its own economy, if Russia, were con Russia had a government that was concerned about its own population, if Russia had a democracy, if Mo Russia had a true free market rather than a criminal, monopolistic, oligopolistic uh, economy, the world could try to help Russia and Russia could have a great future. It is after all, the only country on earth which has uh, exploitable reserves of all important minerals. And it is something, it could be an incredible, it could be an incredible place, but that's not the course that the Russian government has chosen. The Russian government instead has chosen revanchism. It's not just that Vladimir Putin says that the end of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical calamity of the 20th century, is that Mr. Putin has consistently over the last 20 years sought to revise the three key settlements of the 20th century, which the United States was part of, that were intended to put in place an international order that would prevent small conflicts from growing into large ones and open the way to more freedom and democracy for a larger number of people than any in, his, in history. Mr. Putin has a, is trying desperately to overturn the settlement of 1919, which called for a world of nation states in place of empires. <coughs> Mr. Putin celebrates empire and empires are inherently authoritarian and he is an authoritarian first, last, and always. Second, Mr. Putin has been trying to overturn the settlement of 1945, which stressed that the citizenship of people was what mattered, not their ethnicity. Mr. Putin believes that ethnic Russians and Russian speakers have special rights or should have special rights wherever they are, and that the Russian government can intervene on their behalf. That explains the invasion and the uh, Anschluss of Crimea and part of the Donbass in, in Ukraine. And of course, he is first and foremost committed to the reversal of the settlement of 1991, the end of the Soviet bloc and the USSR. He, is, he wants a, a Russian draw regard across the entire area, and he is quite prepared to use military force against his neighbors. Now, he can do that because as weak as the Russian military is and as disordered as the Russian state is, it is far stronger than any of its immediate neighbors, although it is not nearly as strong as the larger groupings of countries around it, including NATO, China, and now Turkey and Iran. The world is changing as a result of the Karabakh uh, declaration of November 10th. Uh, there are now Turkish troops on the territory of the former Soviet space, something that Russia, the Russian government said would never be allowed. And the only exception other than that was the inclusion of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania into the Western Alliance, uh, something that people always treated the Balts as other, but never mind.
The relative power that Russia has allows it to create problems for its neighbors. And as it succeeds in creating problems for those sparking refugee flows, <coughs> it can uh, create problems for ourselves as well. The question, of course, is many people in America would say those are the problems of that region. Those are small countries far away about whom we know nothing. Um, a statement which ought to catch people up given who said it first uh, 80 years ago. What can Russia do elsewhere? Well, Russia can do a great deal precisely because it isn't using conventional methods against the West. It is using hybrid indirect methods and it is doing them in a way that most people are not able to react to because we have no we have no model we have no experience with confronting this and therefore we are not prepared to respond i would suggest that there are three things that we that we are watching mr putin use against the united states and the least important one of these the least important is the only one that's got much attention. And that is the use of the internet and propaganda mechanisms against the United States during its elections. But in what is happening, it is not that the Russian government is creating a new a medium. It is exploiting a medium which the West itself has created and developed beyond its capacity to regulate. Is it is it dangerous? Is it threatening? Yes, but it is something which one can deal with because you have to, you don't have to believe anything that's on the, on the internet. It just might not be true. And we need to have an educational system that will encourage people to be able to make that kind of judgment. Unfortunately, we have seen this as some kind of effort uh, in which we are willless uh, uh, beings that if the Russians broadcast propaganda, we will do whatever they say. That's nonsense, but that's the, that's, that has resulted in obsessive attention to this propaganda effort. I'm not suggesting it should be ignored. I am suggesting, however, it is far, far less important than two other factors which we aren't talking about and which reflect a far more important, uh, far more important weapons, if you will, in Mr. Putin's campaign against the United States. The first of these other two is money and corruption. As I've mentioned, since 1991, criminal groups in and outside of the Russian government have exported to the West well above two trillion U.S. dollars. They have value stripped the economy. They have wrecked uh, industry uh, that was built up in Soviet times. They have not reinvested locally and they have put their money abroad. If you think about it, the total amount of money spent by the Russians on propaganda against the United States is a mere rounding error out of that total. What has happened is that it has put that money into Western banks, Western real estate, Western corporations, and it has changed the way in which those people behave. No longer are they constrained by the danger of being charged with soft on, soft on communism. They are quite willing to see that money doesn't smell and it doesn't matter where it comes from. The problem is the people who have the money make use of it for a variety of purposes. Money, not, not some kind of um, salacious gossip, is how the uh, Russian government moves to control people. If you have any doubt of that, look at the case of former German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder is probably the exhibit A of how that might Russian money has become a way of controlling Western politicians. 
This is a problem that we do not know how to cope with. We do not know how you regulate people's behavior when they are driven by the profit motive and where there is so much money to be made simply by processing this incredible amount of money that has been coming out of Russia. It is going to be very, very difficult to constrain that in the short term. And Mr. Putin understands that. He understands that he can make use of that kind of wealth, deploying it in different ways to ensure that there will not be an objection to, or there will not be support rather, there will not be support for any tough measures against the Russian government. But it is the last of the three elements that I believe Mr. Putin has also put a great deal of hope in. And that is the enormous cadre of Russian specialists in the West. 50 years ago, people became Russian specialists because it was the royal road uh, to rising in the bureaucracy and the foreign policy bureaucracy because Russia was our most important competitor. With the demise of the Soviet Union, that's no longer true. Now what you see, uh, caused by both generational change and changing in the way we train uh, specialists on other countries where they tend not to have the broad cultural uh, training that was required 50 years ago, you see people who are simply acceptant of, the, um, of what they see in another country in ways that are very dangerous. It is, in my view, that the most successful thing the Soviets ever did was to create the academic exchange, which, which had the effect of meaning that anyone who was going to be a rising star in the uh, ac academy on that part of the world had to be able to go there. And if you had to be able to go there, you had to get permission to go there. And if you had to get permission to go there, <laughs> you had to uh, take a position that was acceptable in many cases to the Russian government. I don't know how many people have told me over the years, I'd love to write on that, but if I do, I won't be able to go back. And those kinds of comments came not under Brezhnev or Stalin, they came under Yeltsin and Putin. So we're seeing a situation where we have people inside who are also prepared to explain why we should not question this Russian money, should not question Russian aggression, should understand what Russia is doing as it tries to recover from near death in the 1990s. That is a problem that we need to address. Now, let me end by, suggest, by posing three questions, which I think anyone focusing on this part of the world should be asking. The first is, can we do something about this? The answer is, of course we can. There are many options we have. The question is whether we will and whether we will be prepared to pay the costs that will be involved. If, you want, if Russia has cut off the SWIFT system, which some people have advocated given its aggressive behavior, there will be costs for American corporations. Are we prepared to pay that? I am, but I'm not sure everyone is. Second, should we be doing these things? Again, my view is that a country that does not live, want to live within its own borders, that wants to use force against others to subvert other governments, that has adopted a anti-democratic authoritarian regime, cannot be a long-term friend of the United States. But many people are now at a point of saying there are whole parts of the world that we should simply turn over to regional hegemons. And if one of those happens to be Russia, that's OK. That is a change in how we view the world, view the world from what it was 40 and 50 years ago. And I think it's a dangerous one because regional hegemons, having achieved their goals at that level, invariably choose to try to extend their power more generally. And third, and this is the question that comes ultimately from George Kennan's observations of 75 years ago, 
can we do any of these things in a sustainable way so that we can avoid war but promote the kind of world we would like to see happen? Again, I think the answer is yes, but it is not going to be easy and it is not going to be quick. It is going to require us to rethink how we interact with the rest of the world and to see things that we take as completely normal, as being something other than that. Large financial flows, not, not based on earnings, but on based on seizing or theft from a population are a very dangerous threat. Propaganda that is unconstrained is a dangerous threat. Viewing, having large numbers of people explaining on a constant basis for their own self-interest to be sure, why it is that we should be friends with autocrats is a, is a, is a problem. We have to rethink where we are as a country and what kind of a world we want to live in. It isn't going to be easy, but if we understand that we are up against a system that is based on entirely different values and prepared to use entirely different kinds of weapons against us, we're going to need to do that or we are going to see our own power recede and our own way of life threatened. Thank you. Paul, thank you very much. That was absolutely terrific. Um, I've got some questions and we also have some questions from the audience. Um, the first one is there are some who believe that Russia's, okay, Russia's view of recent color revolutions and their near abroad were orchestrated by the US and the European Union and NATO and that the US pushing for democratic nation states around the world is a direct threat to the Russian regime. Your view, is that how the Russians think? There are many Russians who don't believe that human beings can do anything. They have to be run by someone else. Therefore, it isn't that the Ukrainians decided they wanted to get rid of <coughs> an oligarchic regime. <coughs> Excuse me. They had to be orchestrated. They had to be led by some outside force. It is a view of the human condition which denies the autonomy of individuals. Uh, has the United States supported democracy? Yes, it has. Is that wrong? No. Do many Russians think it's wrong? Absolutely. Um, that doesn't mean we should stop. It should mean that we explain what we are doing and why we are supporting people, be they in Belarus or Ukraine or anywhere else. Okay. Should or could the U.S. and the West have dealt with Russia differently? Could, could we deal with them differently or should we have dealt with them differently since the, the fall of the Soviet Union? And would it have been possible to make them an ally as opposed to the failing state that they are now that does not trust the West and obviously is seeking to undermine the West? So Absolutely. Could we, have, could we have done something differently? We made three horrific mistakes. We should have talked adopted a policy of tough love, not weak neglect. It was going to be terribly difficult for any country to make the transition that Russia has had to go through. And we should have been there to help rather than to say, sink or swim on your own. So we should have given more aid. Second, we should have understood that the real issue was not capitalism and economic reform, the real issue was democracy and developing state institutions that would promote democracy. The fact is, from 1992 on, the United States took the position of proclaiming these places as democracies, even when they were not, and then worrying about economic reform. We should have been worrying about democratic reform from the get-go. Third, there were so many small things that could have been done to show that the United States wanted to integrate Russia into the world community, that it wanted to help the Russian people. We chose not to do those. We decided we have, we've won, we can now look away. And for a decade we did. And then when we were uh, brought up uh, by the September 11th events, we looked to another part of the world and we began to think that maybe authoritarianism isn't such a bad thing. 
which was an extraordinarily uh, unfortunate view because it has played right in to uh, Mr. Putin's style of rule. So recent, we've obviously you talked about the recent skirmishes between Armenia and Azerbaijan and with Armenia ceding territory. And um, obviously Turkey, it seems, is challenging Russia for influence in the Caucasus. Is Turkey using its NATO membership as a cudgel against Russia? And your thoughts on how this plays out? Well, I would go, I would say that what happened between Azerbaijan and Armenia was more than a skirmish. It was an out and out war, which resulted, which allowed Azerbaijan to reconquer uh, about 65 to 70 percent of the territory that Armenia had occupied in the mid 90s. Uh, with respect to Turkey, Turkey is quite prepared to sit behind, to sit as a member of NATO. And probably one of the reasons that no one wanted to call them up on not getting so heavily involved in the Caucasus is no one wanted to take the risk that Turkey might decide we'll leave NATO because that would have that would have created real problems for the alliance in the Middle East and more generally. But Turkey has an agenda. I don't believe it's trying to recreate the Ottoman Empire, as some journalists say, but it certainly wants to be the leader of the Turkic Sunni arc in the north, all the way to Sinjan. It is interested in showing that it has the ability and power to put its troops on the ground in Azerbaijan. That's amazing. Uh, the Russians have conceded something that they swore up and down they would never concede. And in my mind, uh, since I proposed this happening 30 years ago, there's an even bigger concession, and that is the opening of a new corridor between Azerbaijan proper and Nakhchivan, which allows for a direct land link from Istanbul to Baku, and then across the Caspian into Central Asia. This is going to change, this is going to change the geopolitics of the world, um, but I, I think the Turks were willing to use the fact that they were in NATO to slow a Russian response, and the, the NATO's response was slowed because it didn't want to take the chance that Turkey might do something radical, like leave the alliance if anyone challenged it. So it worked both ways. Okay. What happens post-Putin? Things may get worse. Um, there, is a, there is a view that somehow uh, the only possibility is improvement. Um, Putin isn't as bad as it could be. There are people in the Russian government who have much more troglodyte views than he. There are large, there's a large share of the Russian population that is very critical of Putin, not because he isn't for democracy and cooperation with the United States, but because he's cooperated with the West too much and because he's allowed elections to continue. Uh, with respect, an awful lot of people in Russia don't view the world the way we do. They, they want an authoritarian rule. They want a Stalin. And Putin isn't, a, isn't enough of a Stalin from their point of view. We in the West are so used to cre criticizing Putin that we think of him as about as bad as it can get. Not on your life. There are a number of people in the Kremlin near Putin whose policies almost certainly would be even more authoritarian and even more aggressive although they probably will be constrained by Russia's declining resources. From a military perspective, what should we do militarily with respect to Russia? And conversely, what shouldn't we be doing? The first thing we should do is we should negotiate constantly. It's terribly important that the Russians feel they're being listened to. Uh, if a country is aggressive, that's, you, you, talk to, you talk to your opponents. You don't cut them out. Uh, talking is a good thing. Trying to reach agreements on limited things is a good thing. It's useful to us and useful to them. And if it leads to even a small amount of reduction in the Russian military budget, it will that money, some of that money may end up helping the Russian people. And I think we should be trumpeting the fact that our policies are intended to help the Russian people, even if we oppose their government. I think we have to be very, very careful 
about putting American forces beyond Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Although I personally would favor uh, putting both Ukraine and Georgia on the fast track to NATO membership as a way of signaling that we are not in the West going to be at all accepted of further Russian aggression against those two countries. Okay. Um, you talked about the, the, the strength of the Russian military and how it's, you know, it's comparative weakness and it's declining. Um, but what about the Russian submarine force? That one still seems to be a pretty, pretty robust, viable threat. No, the, 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 submarine, the submarine fleet appears to be in better shape than the rest of the Navy. And certainly in better shape than most of the rest of the Russian military. I mean, even their uh, 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 war fighting command aircraft this week had some disastrous things happen to it, as you undoubtedly know. Okay. Um, I, my own, I'm not expert on the, on the submarine fleet. I do know that there have been real problems in refitting uh, some caused by uh, the uh, dry dock disasters that they've suffered over the last several years, some caused by massive corruption, an awful lot of money that is supposed to go to modernization programs, and the modernization programs are invariably announced, never reaches its intended target. So my guess is that some of the things that we assume have been done and that Moscow may even claim have been done, I'm skeptical about. I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting they're so weak, they're a pushover. I'm only suggesting that um, I think we should be skeptical about any claim that the Kremlin makes about what it's managed to achieve. So in terms of economics and, and talking a little bit more about sanctions, um, Obviously, the U.S. and the West has imposed a lot of sanctions on Russia. Um, but if their bankers and their businessmen are in Putin's pocket, how does that work? Well, first off, the sanctions have hurt the wrong people in Russia. They've hurt the people, the, the people rather than most of the business community. We've only very lately come to the idea of personal sanctions. That should have been the first thing to do. Second, we have avoided doing the really tough things that would have had an impact on the economy, like taking them off of SWIFT or impounding their money in Western banks, because that was opposed by Western business interests and Western bankers um, who knew that if we did that, they would never see any of that money again. It would be transferred out and their share of it would have been lost. I would like us to adopt a policy designed to be helpful to the Russian people and to be seen as helpful to the Russian people, but would be directed at the Russian, at the Kremlin elite, including Mr. Putin, who are conducting policies that are anti-Russian as well as anti-Western. And I don't think, I think, unfortunately, we've, adopted up to now a more blunderbuss approach, which has hurt the Russian people and allowed Putin to argue that the West hates Russians and it's willing to make them suffer because I promise you none of the sanctions that have been imposed so far have had dramatic impact on the Russian oligarchs around Putin, all of whom have seen their wealth increase, all of whom have continued to travel abroad the personal sanctions may work eventually, but they've only just started. Okay. We've, we've got a lot of folks out there, um, partially American educated, Russian, Eastern European folks who back Putin and most of his actions. Um, how would you talk to them? Uh, how would you open their eyes? How would you try and change their minds about what's really going on? What would you say to them? Well, first off, invading countries, crossing international borders without permission with military force is generally something that 
people don't oppose, don't approve. Uh, the annexation, the Anschluss of Crimea, was in violation of international law, first, last, and always. The invasion of Georgia was a violation of international law. The uh, behavior of the Russian government with respect to its own population is has been decried as repressive by almost every international human rights organization one cares to name. I think those are legitimate criticisms. And I find I'm, I'm certainly not in favor of a crusade against, uh, certainly against Russians. I think the Russian government does not serve the Russian people's interests or um, uh, uh, the interest of Russia ultimately. I think that a country that doesn't invest heavily in medical care for its people, that allows diseases to spread that shouldn't, uh, that if, there, if one can't criticize that, then what should one be doing? Uh, I don't expect, uh, I, I am someone who has spent his life working on the non-Russian peoples of what was the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. I'm here to tell you that Russian behavior, Moscow's behavior, with respect to those people has not been very good, and it continues to not be very good within the current borders of the Russian Federation. So yes, I'm very critical, um, but I'm worried about the fact that the support for Putin is support against the Russian people, not for them. Putin has claimed that he is the embodiment of Russians, and some Russians think that. But in fact, what Putin has done has hurt the Russian people. They are in worse shape now than they were when he came to power. And uh, there's less health care. Uh, there's uh, the life expectancy, uh, the fact that there, is more, there are more premature deaths, there are fewer new births. Uh, this is an indictment of a society. And I think that uh, some of the responsibility, a large part of that responsibility lies with the government that put that put the, uh, these policies in place. Okay, so now for a really controversial question. And that is, why is President Trump so deferential to Putin? What do you well, think I'm is quite sure on? it has nothing to do with any um, uh, supposed dossier that was discussed in 2016. Uh, my guess is that it has to do with uh, the money that I was talking about. I believe that Russian money probably uh, made its way through various banks, German banks likely, um, and helped him. And I also believe that he sees Russia as a great market where he can hope to expand the Trump enterprise. From his, if you ignore politics altogether, that kind of economic cooperation and uh, use of foreign money is completely uh, uh, legitimate and reasonable. The problem is that anybody who has helped you, who who may help you advance your business interests, or who has given you money so that you can continue to function, is certainly going to be looked at by you as someone you want to cooperate with, not someone you want to stand up to. I, I've never thought that the stories about the dossier uh, pictures, the salacious pictures were true. I do believe, however, that uh, focus on the enormous money, amount of Russian money that's out there looking for places to park have had an impact especially because we have extremely good documentation that much of Russian money has gone into the real estate industry, which is precisely the industry out of which uh, our current president comes. So how do, we, how do we remove the power of the United States banks to, you know, to decrease Russia's stronghold on, on the U.S.? Well, first you know, off, I think we have to... And, First off, I think we have to have vastly better reporting requirements. I think that we have to have much more monitoring uh, than we do. I don't think it's going to be easy because money is fungible and can be moved around quickly and easily. Uh, but I think if people know uh, 
if you look at when money comes into the system and when it went out of some other system, uh, you can begin to draw some conclusions as to what's going on. My guess is that this is about monitoring and about publicity rather than about heavy handed regulation, which I don't think will work from what I can see of the way financial markets work today. Okay. Last question of the night. Any chance of U.S. cooperation uh, with the Russians in Syria? I would like to see that happen. But for that to happen, there would have to be an awful lot of discussions about issues that we aren't yet prepared even to raise, let alone reach an agreement. Uh, it is not wrong that the Russians and ourselves do not have the same view on things. It is a mistake, however, if we don't talk about where our differences are. So there's no confusion. My greatest concern is that by not talking, by not focusing on what Russians are thinking and saying, we may misread what they're about and then they will misread us and we will get an escalation. I would be, I would, I'm in favor first, last, and always in talking and in finding out exactly what they're thinking and in paying close attention. Uh, we should, I would, if I were, had five minutes of uh, President-elect Biden's term uh, time, I would urge him to restart the FBIS JPRS system of translating 60 to 80 pages of Russian materials every day for reading in the US government and the academic community so that people would be aware of what's being said and going on. It's what I try to do in a much more limited uh, uh, homespun way with my Windows series, uh, because I think we need to know what they're thinking and what they're saying. Okay, Paul, thank you very much. That was terrific, um, as always. Uh, for the folks online, just so you know, our next webinar, we're taking a little bit of a break for the holiday season. Uh, we'll be back online on Wednesday, January 13th. Our speaker then will be Mead Treadwell. He's the former Lieutenant of the Governor of Alaska, and he's gonna talk on what we call the battle for the Arctic. Um, and so until next time, take care, have a very happy holiday season and be safe and be healthy and have a good night. Paul, again, thank you. Thank you.